You've got some serious balls, man. I've been told. Wasn't sure you were going to show after I trashed your acting in my last Fast and Furious review. I think you hit your mark. Well, if you run with me, I can't promise I'll go easy on you. That's what it takes. I just want to race. And I just want to review. Let's do it. <laughs> Ride or die, remember? Too soon? Ready? Steady. This is movie night. Hello and welcome to movie night. In-depth film reviews in less than five minutes. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. Tonight I'm reviewing the first seven pictures in the Fast and Furious franchise. And I say first because, let's be honest, Universal will probably make ten more of these things. Although I've already discussed the first and sixth installments here on the show, I've decided to rewrite and revisit some of my older thoughts for this new special. What began as an unfocused series about street racing has since morphed into a mammoth franchise with high-octane stunts worth over two billion dollars. Perpetually existing on the fringes of reality, these movies are often unbelievable and over the top. But that's precisely why we love them. We'll begin with the original, The Fast and the Furious. Released in June of 2001, this Rob Cohen street racing action film made $169 million in profit against his $38 million budget. Borrowing heavily from the plot structure of 1991's Point Break, the 106-minute story follows an undercover officer who infiltrates a gang of street racing criminals before becoming enamored with their world. The cast of young busters, brawlers, and boneheads is led by Paul Walker, an eager and enthusiastic hero who's easy to connect with. The soft-spoken and large-bodied Vin Diesel is featured as his untrusting friend, who preaches the importance of his fast lifestyle by remarking, I live my life a quarter mile at a time. Nothing else matters. For those ten seconds or less, I am free. It's a crude but apt mantra that binds the entire Fast and Furious saga together, and even made its way onto one of my t-shirts, which I'd love for you to buy over at Jog Wheels Merchandise Store, thatreference.com. In one of her first significant roles, Michelle Rodriguez just disappoints by grunting one-liners and frowning for most of the PG-13 rated film. Jordana Brewster, however, commendably brings life to her otherwise one-dimensional character. The rest of the cast struts around wearing embarrassing outfits and spitting overly technical jargon that even gearheads will be annoyed with. This is a fascinating look at an underground culture of fast cars, neon lights, and slutty women most audiences aren't familiar with. The soundtrack mixes loud rap music with funky beats, but it unfortunately undercuts one pivotal scene with its distracting presence. The frantic editing by Peter Horns provides the illusion of speed and intensity without ever really showing any movement. It's appropriate and exciting, but it rarely shows off how fast these cars can actually go. Speaking of which, an early sprint between racers not only lasts 11 times longer than it should, but actually incorporates over 15,000 unique sound effects, at least according to IMDb's trivia page. Nice car. What's the retail on one of those? More than you can afford, pal. Ferrari. <laughs> Characters make frequent references to a huge event known as Race Wars, where Walker will finally prove himself to the crew. But annoyingly, the Fast and the Furious wastes this exotic location's potential by featuring it only briefly. Back-to-back high-speed action sequences close out the film, but they pale in scope to the efforts of later installments. And what would have been a surprise to even the most clairvoyant Hollywood insiders, this unassuming illegal street racing film spawns six sequels and counting, making it Universal Studios' most profitable franchise. The series would eventually evolve from this humble Los Angeles racing scene to international heists and unrealistic action spectacles, but this inaugural effort is what introduced most of the key players in an organic and believable way. Although the film does little to convince you that anyone here is a great actor, or that dropping $20,000 into a 1995 Toyota Supra is a good idea, it still provides old-fashioned entertainment on every viewing. The most stated and least ambitious entry in the series, The Fast and the Furious is a gritty take on established formulas that pays off with thrilling action and authentic characters. And here's what you had to say about it in the YouTube comments. <music> in 
In spite of the weaker acting and story, you thought the first Fast and the Furious film was great. I'm sticking with my original rating for this one, a 7 out of 10. Next up tonight, Too Fast, Too Furious. This obnoxiously titled follow-up was released in June of 2003 by director John Singleton. Despite feeling like a shameless cash grab, the PG-13 rated film actually managed to triple its $76 million budget. Paul Walker leads an entirely new cast, where the FBI has reunited him with an old friend so they can take down Miami's criminal kingpin. Still acting and dressing like a spoiled teen, Walker is aimless and aloof without Vin Diesel at his side, who sadly sets this picture out. Tyrese Gibson, however, is a welcome addition as Paul's fast-talking, wise-cracking childhood buddy who injects the film with effective comic relief. Cole Hauser is not nearly menacing enough for the bad guy role, but rapper-turned-actor Chris Ludacris Bridges is actually really great in his small supporting role. I only wish he was utilized a bit more. Rounding out the core group is the stunning Eva Mendez as the undercover customs agent who may be getting too close to her mark, in a parallel to Walker's original dilemma. It's the playful and contentious relationship between the leads that makes the 107-minute feature worth watching, though. Like when Gibson nervously asks his partner, you're not gonna do what I think you're gonna do, moments before Walker performs a dangerous stunt. Light on substance, but heavy on style, the picture lives up to its namesake with fantastic race sequences, even if the drivers do seem to execute a seemingly infinite number of gear changes. A sharply edited four-car race through the well-lit roadways of Florida includes an awesome computer-assisted shot that zooms past each vehicle in a single unbroken move. Much of the dialogue here boils down to disposable trash talking, with each sentence annoyingly punctuated by bro or bra. Too Fast, Too Furious at least provides fun introductions to eventual mainstays of the franchise. Besides Bridges and Gibson, this is also the first time we see Walker's Nissan Skyline tearing up the roadways. As the only Fast film not to feature a single major character death, though, the resulting tone has a far less serious vibe. Which is why a torture scene involving a flesh-eating rat feels particularly gruesome and out of place. Pulling a Will Smith-type move, Ludacris performs four separate tracks on the film's rap-oriented soundtrack, which is an appropriate fit for the scantily clad women, neon lights, and bright sunshine of South Beach. The stark departure from the themes that bind the rest of the series together makes this film the weakest of the bunch, but racing fans should enjoy this smoothly paced action on repeat viewings. Often unrealistic and generally pretty stupid, Too Fast, Too Furious boils down to a brainless romp with occasional thrills and spills. I thought it was alright. Third up, The Fast and the Furious, Tokyo Drift. This action crime drama was released in June of 2006, where it nearly doubled its estimated $85 million budget. Abandoning all of the characters and locations from the previous two installments, this PG-13 rated effort introduces us to a whole new group of street racers and their adversarial relationships. With enough chest hair for a character twice his age, Lucas Black stars as an impatient teen who becomes a rising star in Tokyo's drift racing scene. Despite his obnoxious southern accent, he's actually a pretty enthusiastic protagonist, even if his acting is limited to him grimacing and winking. Defending himself against an automotive insult, Lucas confidently responds, It's not the ride, it's the rider. It's appropriate that the black sheep of the Fast franchise is led by an actor whose surname is Black. His reckless behavior in a thrilling car chase that opens the film, against the oldest brother from Home Improvement, forces him to relocate to the land of the rising sun, where the story pivots to a fish-out-of-water narrative. Once the 104-minute film is done focusing on his culture shock, we're introduced to the supporting cast, which includes juvenile rapper Bow Wow, Nathaniel Kelly, Brian Goodman, Brian T, and Sung Kang making his first of four appearances in the franchise. Kang has a few key moments delivering sage advice as the mentor character, while T is perfect as the cocky, close-talking bad guy you'll love to hate. Goodman provides an interesting father-son dynamic with Black as well, which are some of the picture's strongest scenes. I was annoyed, however, that even in a cast populated entirely by Asians, the Peruvian-born Kelly was chosen as the romantic foil. Well, at least I think that was her intended purpose. She never actually kisses Black, who seems more turned on by a V8 motor than the sexy women around him. Like the cars they're driving, the music here is a fast and loud blend of American rock and Japanese pop. <laughs> What the? Police car 
is your only factory tune? You can do better than 180K, they can't catch you. So they don't even try. You know what? I'm beginning to like this country already. Director Justin Lin makes his franchise debut with a decently steady and focused style that shows off the exotic imports as well as the Asian babes. Although the professional stunt drivers employed on Tokyo Drift reportedly destroyed north of 100 vehicles, all of their drifting was accomplished without the aid of CGI, and makes rally driver Ken Block look like an amateur. As it's explained in the film though, drifting is only performed for show and doesn't actually provide an advantage. Much like the franchise itself, the slick skidding maneuver is all fluff and little substance. Universal Studios actually relinquished their rights to the Riddick series just to secure Vin Diesel for a final scene cameo, which is a fun bit of fan service that attempts to tie the picture together with later installments. Indeed, with no other returning characters and as the lowest grossing entry in the series, it would have been easy to disavow this movie and pretend it was just a bastard spinoff that didn't work. Instead, the franchise doubled down on this picture's continuity by referencing its irrelevant plot in the next three films, which in effect became de facto prequels. This retroactive integration actually improves this movie's divisive legacy, saving it from being the worst in the series. The paint by numbers approach of this film was worth seeing at least once, and only then because of its title and unique oriental location. And while some of the stunts and chases are frantic and enjoyable, the characters lack depth and the story originality. The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift, exciting automotive stunts, can overcome the forgettable cast and disposable script. Now let's check in with your thoughts. Calling it uninventive and disappointing, you rated Tokyo Drift a 4 out of 10. I'll be a bit more forgiving myself and score this an alright. Now for tonight's poll question, who's your favorite Fast and Furious character? Leave your response as a comment below, or try to guess my answer if you're feeling lucky. Before we get to my fourth review, I have to rant about this franchise's ridiculous titles. It's bad enough that with a cast of dozens, only two major actors never did a film without the other. There's seriously just a single pair, Bridges and Gibson for those wondering. But the naming conventions for this now seven picture series is endlessly annoying. Universal Studios actually had to purchase the title rights to the 1955 racing picture, The Fast and the Furious, for the first entry in their series. In part two, they adopted a childish double numeral spelling that still makes me cringe. For the Japanese-based spinoff, the producers dropped the numbers altogether in favor of including a subtitle format that was never seen again. The confusingly titled fourth installment simply removes two uses of the the from the original title. To drive home the succinct alliteration they waited five movies to use, the fifth picture spells out the numeral, until part six brought it back. And just when I thought the series had finally reached a decent naming structure, part seven throws it out the window by stripping the word fast entirely. Seven movies in 14 years, and each and every one of them uses a different format for its title. I know it's nitpicky bullshit, but as a cinephile, these vastly inconsistent titles really frustrate me. What are they gonna do next? Just combine the two words together and call 2017's eventual sequel, Fate? I wouldn't put it past him. Well, thank you for indulging this quick rant. Let's get back to the reviews though with my thoughts on the fourth picture, Fast and Furious. Released on April 3rd, 2009, this $85 million action crime film was a surprise hit that breathed new life into the fading franchise, earning $363 million at the box office. Justin Lin returns to helm the curiously titled sequel prequel that reunites most of the cast from part one. The first true direct follow-up to the events of the original picture sees Paul Walker once again teaming up with a reluctant and untrusting Vin Diesel so the two can bring down a heroin importer by infiltrating his operation. The well-paced 107 minute story begins with a furiously fun and pulse-pounding cold open hijacking of an oil tanker in the Dominican Republic. As the exploding trailer rolls down the steep highway, Diesel simply stares impending death in the face like it doesn't affect him. Meanwhile, one of LA's shittiest and least trustworthy cops somehow got himself an FBI badge which thankfully comes with an updated wardrobe and much needed haircut. Reconnecting with his old flame, Jordana Brewster in another understated performance, Walker is reminded that maybe you're the bad guy pretending to be the good guy. Finally examining the life-altering consequences of their decisions from part one, this is a much darker and emotional story, which thankfully includes noticeably stronger performances from the entire cast as well, especially Michelle Rodriguez who is no longer wooden and confused. Gal Gadot's sexy accent and slim figure make for great eye candy, while Joan Ortiz is convincing as the determined drug smuggler, but he seems to unnecessarily accentuate his Spanish accent just for show. You know, I've been thinking, when you blew up your car back there, you blew up mine too. Yeah. Yeah, so now you owe me a 10 second car. Is that right? Yeah. How are you? 
completely. Although the PG-13 rated plot is more complex than this type of picture merits, it reunites our familiar protagonists in a believable way, allowing ample time for big set pieces and awesome races. Their slick driving skills are on full display during a pivotal audition race that smartly employs 3D GPS graphics to help follow the otherwise confusing geography of the drivers. Scoring his second of four pictures for the series, Brian Tyler provides the suitable, if unremarkable, music, which he had to compose in only three days. Lynn's direction of the anamorphic frame is often quicker than necessary during the action-oriented parts, but never to the point of disorientation or confusion. Touching upon themes of betrayal and second chances, the dramatic interplay between these now-established characters has never been stronger. So if you like the unique blend of fast cars and big butts intertwined with emotionally complex characters, this is one racing movie worth seeing a few times. Although it doesn't reach the scope and excitement of its successors, Fast and Furious is a strong return to form with excellent driving and character dynamics. I thought it was a great movie. And now my review of Fast Five. This ambitious action film directed by Justin Lin poured gasoline on a fire and brought the Fast franchise back in a big way. Released on April 29th, 2011, this sequel deliberately departed from the series' street racing theme in favor of a wider focus on heists and action. The go-for-broke decision absolutely paid off, though, to the tune of a half a billion in profit, above the film's $125 million budget. On the run from the law following their exploits at the end of the last picture, Vin Diesel and Paul Walker reunite their old crew for one massive score to help buy their freedom once and for all. This is Vin and Paul's first picture together as allies from the beginning, and their loyalty and love for one another is the real heart of this picture. Both men are at top form. Hot on their trail, though, is newcomer Dwayne Johnson as a hard-ass, beefed-up DSS agent who provides a fantastic and necessary threat sorely lacking from previous entries. Injecting the series with a huge shot of gravitas, he's like a less tactful version of Tommy Lee Jones in The Fugitive, but on steroids. Briefing his team on their marching orders, The Rock barks, We find him, we take him as a team, and we bring him back. And above all else, we don't ever, ever let them get into cars. Jordana Brewster, Tyrese Gibson, Chris Bridges, Matt Schultz, Gal Gadot, and Sung Kang all return as well. And despite the size of this talented ensemble, each player is given their own individual moment and responsibility to really make their own. Reintegrating the sidekick characters from the lesser respected second and third films really helps tie this franchise together, without having to devote any of the already lengthy 130 minute runtime to their backstory. While these former street racers might not be the most convincing gang to pull off such an elaborate heist, it's damn fun to watch their trial and error process as they put their plan into motion. An excellent scene early has our foolishly brave heroes hijacking exotic cars from a speeding locomotive in what is easily the greatest train robbery since, well, the great train robbery. The explosive stunt that caps off this opening set piece is a wonderful example of big budget action done right. I got a hundred thousand says I can take you all to the next quarter mile. Yeah, you broke ass has got a hundred grand. We pull off this job, I will. The next two lights, 100,000. We don't pull this job off, we're probably dead anyway. Let's make it a million. I like that. All right, million dollar quarter mile. All right then. Only live once. Let's do it. What do you say, Don? We're talking or we racing? Just don't cheat this time. Gotta let that go. The film's transition away from focusing on racing is perhaps most evident when an important pink slip race is hyped up before immediately cutting to Diesel already returning in his new car, omitting the duel entirely. The undisputed highlight of the picture, and perhaps the entire Fast series itself, is the climactic heist of $100 million cash, which sees Diesel and Walker dragging a massive vault through the streets of Rio de Janeiro in their tricked-out Dodge Chargers. Besides being awesomely unique and furiously fun, most of the driving and stunt work here was accomplished with practical effects and actual drivers, making the crashes and explosions way more convincing. The incredible chase is scored with intense music from returning composer Brian Tyler, which is mixed with plenty of loud tire screeches and gunshots. As unbelievable as most of this mayhem is, the characters themselves are amusingly just as incredulous. A tightly crafted production that mixes in just the right amount of wide shots during the faster scenes, while letting steadier shots dominate the dramatic portions. Almost half an hour longer than previous films, the PG-13 rated adventure tends to drag in the middle, but the endearing characters, thrilling action, epic fistfights, and inventive stunts more than make up for it. A hugely enjoyable and endlessly watchable experience, Fast Five is pure, unadulterated entertainment. I thought it was amazing. Before we continue, a reminder now to check out my third YouTube channel, The Movie Night Archive, which has quick, nicely categorized videos of every movie I've reviewed here on the show, as well as my thoughts on upcoming films. Last week, I previewed Mission Impossible 5 Rogue Nation. Now, my review of Fast and Furious 6. 
The sixth entry in the inconsistently titled Ensemble Action Racing franchise, this $160 million entry from director Justin Lin was released worldwide on May 24, 2013. An explosive hit that began the summer film season and earned a staggering $788 million, making it, appropriately, the sixth highest grossing picture of that year. After opening with an inventive clip show sequence that nicely recalls iconic moments from the previous films, the PG-13 rated movie settles in with its necessary exposition. Fresh off their successful heist, Vin Diesel and Paul Walker are brought out of exile by DSS agent Dwayne Johnson, who promises pardons in exchange for help tracking down British baddie Luke Evans. He's an underdeveloped nemesis hell-bent on chaos for reasons never adequately explained. Explained. But our racing crew is more interested in one of his employees, the supposedly deceased Michelle Rodriguez, who refuses a rescue attempt. Regarding his former lover, the cocky and disarming Diesel explains, you never turn your back on family, even when they do. The 130 minute extravaganza ramps up the stakes and speed, constantly flirting with realism in the process. Seeing these characters risk their lives in giant action set pieces is undeniably entertaining. But it can also be hilarious, as Tyrese Gibson and Chris Bridges bring plenty of comedic relief, resulting in many laugh-out-loud moments. But it's curious these multi-millionaire racers can't afford some hands-free walkie-talkies. They'd probably be safer behind the wheel that way. Rather than starting fresh with a detached story, Fast and Furious 6 embraces the franchise's involved continuity in a way that actually strengthens the story. To that end, though, a slower character-building middle portion is missing pressure from the villain, resulting in a drawn-out stretch devoid of any tension. What do we know? We know they have to be running custom engines. You heard that flip car going through those gears. Sequential transmission. That didn't sound like a normal engine. It was a turbo diesel. It sounded like something you hear at Le Mans. Did you see it take all those hits and still stay flat in the corners? Yeah, hydraulics. Or magnetic suspension. But who not only has access to the components, but can fabricate something like that? Maybe a handful of shops in London? Regular tuner shops aren't gonna cut it on this one. We're gonna have to dig deeper than that. Han, Giselle, Roman, you're up. We find the guy who made that car, we find Shaw. The editing and visuals, though, are both top-notch, as Lin's direction keeps the fast-paced thrills easy to understand and follow, especially during one fantastic chase where the crew uses a classic Mustang as an anchor to take down a car-crushing tank speeding down a highway. A sequence with parallel brawls in London's tube showcases some great girl-on-girl -girl fight choreography when Rodriguez tackles newcomer Gina Carano. Later, a climactic chase on an impossibly long runway sees our seemingly invincible heroes defying physics when they attempt to crash a giant cargo plane. Keeping in fashion with previous entries, a post credit sequence gives further backstory to a scene in Tokyo Drift by setting up an applause-worthy cliffhanger for Furious 7. An almost self-aware, over-the-top thrill ride with plenty of babes, explosions, hot rods, and excitement, this is a ridiculously enjoyable and rewatchable movie, even if it is occasionally brainless popcorn fun. Fast and Furious 6 may have unbelievable action, but the whole thing is furiously exciting. Now let's read a few of your comments from YouTube. Delivering exactly what it promised, you scored this in 8. A crazy experience from start to finish, I thought it was pretty awesome myself. Finally tonight, my review of the newest entry, Furious 7. Released worldwide on April 3rd, 2015, this ensemble action film from director James Wan was produced on an overextended budget of $250 million after the untimely and tragic death of Paul Walker. Transitioning from horror to action, Wan does a commendable job with the complicated production, which was hampered by unenviable rewrites and lengthy delays. There's no doubt, though, this picture will rake in a huge profit. I'm personally predicting about a billion dollars, as well as a few more sequels. The crew of racers turned robbers are now being hunted by Jason Statham, the vengeful brother of Six's bad guy. Meanwhile, the PG-13 rated plot foolishly incorporates an overly technical MacGuffin into the mix, as well as Damanjin Hansu as a Somalian terrorist. It's an unnecessary complication that doesn't amount to much. Logically, the character motivations don't make any sense either. The Furious crew band together to help a shadowy government type, played by Kurt Russell, for the explicit purpose of tracking down Statham. But the British villain routinely shows up unannounced anyway, making the crew's this-for-that responsibilities entirely meaningless. Vin Diesel once again leads the giant cast of meatheads, brawlers, and drivers with what I can only imagine was the toughest role of his career. Forced to pretend like your best friend is running alongside you while simultaneously mourning his death could not have been easy for him. But his performance here lives up to the challenge. Mourning a fellow character's death, Diesel paraphrases Scottish poet Thomas Campbell when he remarks, we live in the hearts of those we leave behind. It's an inspirational quote that is an excellent fit for the film's more somber theme. 
He carries the picture to the best of his abilities, but the dual lead structure common in earlier installments is definitely missing here. Plenty of familiar faces return, with Michelle Rodriguez given a heftier romantic subplot alongside Vin, but an early scene where the two reconnect over a visit to Race Wars proved entirely pointless, and likely should have been cut for time in the already bloated 134 minute picture, the franchise's longest. Sidelined for most of the movie, Dwayne Johnson still gets a couple great scenes to really kick ass, like his opening bout with Statham, which sees the two muscled up dudes tossing each other through seven separate pieces of glass. Speaking of Jason, he's awesome as the villain, but similarly is given little to do besides shouting threats and punching people. You thought this was gonna be a street fight? Damn right it is. Now playing a character literally half his age, Lucas Black returns for a single scene cameo that nicely connects some of the events of Tokyo Drift into the Fast Universe. Newcomer Ronda Rousey thankfully only has a few short lines, as her delivery is so god-awful, they might just be the worst of the entire series. These parties bore me to death. As for the elephant in the room, it's bad enough that a series that continually deals with death and car crashes lost one of its own in that exact situation. Which makes Walker's inclusion here, in his final ever appearance, so much more tragic. But thanks to a great deal of care and consideration from his friends and family, it never feels exploitative. Impressive camera trickery, CGI masking, and body double work from his younger brothers Caleb and Cody make his character's inclusion near seamless. Rather than writing him out, Walker remains a presence in nearly every key scene. But oftentimes it does feel like you're watching a movie filmed entirely with stunt doubles as none of his detailed close-ups linger for more than a second or two. Of the more dramatic moments he did finish prior to his death, an emotional phone call with his longtime co-star Jordana Brewster is especially well acted, and may very well be one of the best performances of his abbreviated career. Effortless in these quieter moments, as well as the bullet-dodging destruction, it's easy to understand why he was such a beloved actor. Instead of a cheap and perhaps inappropriate on-screen death, Paul's charismatic and congenial memory is honored by allowing his character to literally drive off into the sunset. His co-stars share dialogue that unabashedly alludes to their real-life friend's passing, it's heartfelt and positive, without ever becoming too sappy. After all the consequence-free destruction and death-defying stunts, this surrogate memorial that concludes the film is capped off with two simple words on a white background. For Paul. Scored by the haunting Wiz Khalifa and Charlie Puth original See You Again, it's a beautiful send-off that definitely induces tears. I for one am gonna miss this guy. As for the action, Furious 7 delivers in spades, an insane stunt that sees Diesel and Walker flying a supercar between three adjacent Abu Dhabi skyscrapers is as amazing as it is unrealistic. Earlier, a skydiving car chase along a Colorado mountaintop is rife with nail-biting thrills and giant collisions that culminates with a bus teetering on the edge of a cliff in a suspenseful moment reminiscent of a similar sequence in The Lost World. Bouncing between these set pieces, though, the movie lacks a definable purpose or direction. The lack of cohesion is certainly understandable given the extenuating circumstances of this film's troubled production, but it doesn't quite make it acceptable. The plot is a bit scattershot, the characters aren't always utilized correctly, but the impressive stunt work and touching tribute to Walker make this a must-see for all fans of the series. Going above and beyond the scope and believability of previous films, Furious 7 provides fantastic excitement that poignantly eulogizes one of its own. I thought it was awesome. Finally tonight, here's what you're saying about other movies currently playing in theaters. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review with the JPMN hashtag. Next week, for no particular occasion, we'll be reviewing movies that focus on hyper-accelerated intelligence. The Lawnmower Man, starring Piers Brosnan, Bradley Cooper in Limitless, and the 2014 picture Lucy with Scarlett Johansson. If you've seen these films, share your opinions by voting in the polls below or by leaving a comment review. I read all of them and will include the best in the next episode. If you'd like to watch more Movie Night reviews, check out the related videos on the right, or click subscribe to be notified of all future uploads. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for updates and exclusive content between episodes. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.